Please welcome the Future Studies and Forecasting Chair, Singularity University, Paul Sappho. Good morning. It is so much fun to be here, and it's so different than what I usually get to do at Stanford. You're about to have a day of people going deep on 3D and all the technology, which is something I usually do. And looking at the agenda, I thought, this is great. I don't have to do that part. I can step back and provide some context. The, talk a little bit about the shape of change and where we are at this particular moment in, in 3D. And I think it's a really interesting moment. Things are out on the horizon. They're just about to change and about to get really, really interesting. So some context here. Uh, this is the mandatory um, Moore's Law slide. Everybody here knows about Moore's Law and exponentials. And we are in an exponential age. And this is a moment in time where matter is about to become exponential. And the exponential phenomena of Moore's Law is about a lot more than just bits and processors and the like. And in fact, there's one place where matter has already become exponential, and that's with photovoltaic cells. If you think about the price history of photovoltaics, we're below grid parity today because we have learned to manufacture these things so efficiently. Now, there's not 3D yet in, in uh, photovoltaics, but this is a real indicator of how transformative exponential phenomena are. The problem is, even though we all can invoke Moore's law and the like, we're just not wired to understand what exponentials mean when they hit our culture and they hit our business. And so here's a little exercise to ask yourself, how far will 30 exponential steps take you? So imagine I take, well, not imagine, let me take 30 linear steps. One, two, three, four, five, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, I'm running out of space, 14. So 30 exponential steps takes me to the back of the room and back to the stage. Now ask yourself, how far would 30 exponential steps take me? So the first step, I've got one step, and the second one, I actually start on the other one. So it's about there. Third step, uh, Jason will do this much better than me in a couple of minutes. Third step there, and I can't do the fourth step. So how far does 30 exponential steps take you? Just shout out a distance. Would it get me back to Silicon Valley? To the sun. Other guesses? You're in the right neighborhood. It will take 24 orbits around the Earth. That's the difference between 30 linear steps and 30 exponential steps. And we're in a moment where matter is about to turn exponential. So the scale of surprise ahead in 3D and additive is, is bigger even than what you were seeing downstairs. We're just at the start of this. And that's the problem with nonlinearity. We're just not wired to think about nonlinear phenomena. We tend to overestimate things in some ways and underestimate in others. And of course, it comes down to picking that point on the curve where everything changes and proof that exponentials are everywhere. Uh, this is the mandatory slide to show your teenager when they start going off to college and say, this is why you pay your credit card off every month, because at about 30 doublings, uh, things get really serious. Here's what I see when this is applied to industry take-up of new technologies. The normal order is that the future always arrives late and in unexpected ways. That flat spot on the curve before the transformation point, most ideas, even in Silicon Valley, take 20 years to become an overnight success. Uh, and inevitably, what happens is most people they haven't heard about technology at all, so they get surprised when it takes off. People who be, are sensitized to the technology get to be wrong not once but twice. They tend to overestimate things in the short term because it seems so obvious, like everybody in this room, the implications of 3D are so obvious that of course it's gonna happen quickly, but it takes a while for the rest of the world to catch up. A lesson I learned from a 
rancher who lived down the road from us when I was a kid. It was probably the most important forecasting lesson I ever learned. He said, son, never mistake a clear view for a short distance. Well, the good news is if you want to look for a short-term success, look for something that's been tootling along for about 20 years and hasn't quite taken off. 3D has been around for a very long time. And uh, I'm sure many of you in this room have uh, a drawer full of various 3D tchotchkes. You know, there's, uh, 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 that's the Stanford Hoover Tower, and, and of course, everybody. I recommend having one of these. It's a sintered titanium uh, uh, beer bottle opener, uh, which is, you know, mandatory as a Silicon Valley person to have. Well, you know, this stuff looks a little silly, um, but we go through this phase, and we've been through this before. Whenever we get a new material, a new technology, we always use the technology to pave the cow paths. That is, do some old thing in a different way with the entirely new technology. So this is um, polyoxybenzene methylene glycol hydride, also known as Bakelite, uh, invented here not far from Manhattan by Leo Bakeland in 1907. It's the first modern plastic, thermoset resin. And what did they do when we had the first modern plastic? Everybody spent their time trying to make it look like wood and tortoiseshell. So this is a very stylish travel bar uh, 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 gizmo that you know, is nice uh, pseudo animal horn. Well, what happens is after a while, everybody gets tired of paving the cow pass. And they said, let's let plastic be plastic. And then things get interesting because all of a sudden you're making things that never existed before. And so, um, for example, I've got this in my pocket. It doesn't look like much. It's a little tiny artifact. It's a Bakelite Art Deco skyscraper nightlight. Half a watt, 125 volts. Um, and, and coincidentally, it was made by GE. And so we talk about smart materials you know, combining electronics and materials. Well, this was it in 1930. And it seems like such a small thing, but it was, a, it was an example of saying, wait a second, this is an entirely new kind of material. We can do something we've never done before. Let's combine electrics and plastic. And you couldn't have done this with any material other than Bakelite. That's what innovation is about. Now, it's easy to kind of make fun of people saying, well, you know, gee whiz, you paved the cow paths first. This is the normal innovation process. And the way to take advantage in an exponential space is to clearly understand that, that we start out, the future arrives a little more slowly than we expect in the early phase, and then when things take off, it happens much, much faster. And a real key to this is you listen for the Doppler shift, uh, that, that moment where, wait a second, things are moving a little more quickly. And let me give you an example from January. This is a slide I put together, and I apologize, I put the star in the wrong spot. These are all the forecasts by the US Department of Energy of battery cost performance out to 2030. Very bold forecast. Early on, most people overestimate the short term. In this case, Tesla has already made this chart obsolete because that little star shows where Tesla's performance was in January 2018. Notice that it was where the DOE had things in 2030. That's what you want to watch for. And when you map this against that starting to pave the cow paths and then having deep innovation, it starts to look like this. So this is the very first uh, transistor. Uh, invented not far from here in New Jersey. Uh, uh, John Bardeen and Walter Brittain invented it, and William Shockley took credit. Um, and, uh, and, and you can see it's a, it's a lab experiment, and it could have taken any shape at all. You know, how could you use a transistor? And what's interesting, and again, I'll put this up on, uh, on the screen, the first transistors look like this. And you say, huh. Kind of interesting, why the pins? You know, why a transistor could have been any form? Well, it turns out there were pins on the first transistors because they were a vacuum tube substitute, literally. This is a 6J6, 
That was the most ubiquitous vacuum tube device. This was, you know, if you were a nerd before 1947, you had a whole bunch of 6J6s uh, in, in a desk drawer somewhere. And a transistor was a vacuum tube substitute. And that was revolutionary because transistors, unlike vacuum tubes, didn't burn out and they didn't give off as much heat. And the real limitation for computing at the time wasn't the size of the vacuum tubes. It was the fact that vacuum tubes tended to burn out. So the more vacuum tubes you had in the computer, you were spending more and more time substituting tubes. And so they went, this is great. We can get rid of the vacuum tubes. And off we went, but it was a vacuum tube substitute. It then took them a couple of years to get to the next phase. They said, wait, wait, wait a second, maybe single discrete transistors is kind of inefficient because we have to do all that wiring and soldering. And we got to the monolithic idea. The first integrated circuit in 1958, this is a picture of it. Well, it's a picture of one of the two. Um, it was simultaneously discovered by Jack Kilby and Bob Noyce within six months of each other. Uh, Jack was a better scientist and Bob was a better businessman. Um, you know, we all tend, whenever something new comes in, to our businesses and our lives, you're focused on making it practical, the tendency is to stand on a whale and fish for minnows. Uh, well, Jack understood that the whale was a little bigger. Interesting coincidence that they both came up with the same idea at the same time, but it's not a coincidence. This process of deploying the technology is a cultural process, and riding that curve is, requires not just a deep understanding of the technology, but a deep understanding of the cultural mood and the opportunities for business transformation. So that was the next phase. We said, gee, we don't need individual transistors. Let's put a whole bunch together. That was the monolithic idea. And then, of course, 10 years later, we get the first microprocessor when they said, huh, we don't just have to put components on this thing. Let's just put the whole darn computer on a chip. And of course, you know where all of that is going. So going back to this, that S-curve, that transformation moment defines the line between the initial stage of imitation. It's an essential part of the process. And, and, and that's the period. The period of imitation requires strategic patience. But on the other side of the transformation moment, is the innovation stage, and that's where it requires acceleration. The challenge early on is how do you patiently wait for the world to catch up? The challenge on the latter half is how the heck do I stay on that line as it's going upwards? I can't do more than three exponential steps. Um, and so the same thing is true. Anybody in this room a surfer? Any surfers just show a hand? Oh, okay. In back, uh, way in back. Where do you surf, sir? Montara, my neighborhood, dude. This is awesome. Uh, so, if you ever go surfing, it's all about timing. So think about this: is the wave that you catch, and a surfer will tell you if you you know looking over the horizon, if you the wave's coming, if you start paddling too soon. Um, you, your arms will be tired by the time the wave comes and it will roll under you and end up on the beach and all your friends will stand there laughing at you. On the other hand, if you start paddling too late, the wave will reach you, it'll catch you, but you won't quite have the speed you need to ride the wave and you will discover why they make sandpaper out of beach sand. That's the challenge at catching this transformation moment. And 3D and additive are right on the edge of this transformation moment. There is, and again, this is the luxury I have because you're about to hear about all the technology. I get to give you the context. And I think one of the wisest 3D additive visionaries there was, was a designer whose office was right here in New York, not very far from this location. His name was Raymond Lowy. And he's the, the gentleman who streamlined steam engines and streamlined coffee pots and streamlined pencil sharpeners and all the like. He was absolutely brilliant. And his design principle is codified as the Maya principle, 
which stands for Most Advanced Yet Acceptable. Whether you're an investor looking at 3D, your company trying to apply it to your work, that, I think, is the mantra of how to stay on that curve, not to get too far ahead of it, and not to get too far behind, is you say, what's the most advanced yet acceptable? Think about the microprocessor. In theory, the microprocessor could have been de developed in the early 1950s, but if you had dropped it into the electronics industry, people wouldn't have known what it was or how to use it. They would have assumed, like the conspiracy theorists say, that in fact it was recovered from a crashed flying saucer in Roswell, New Mexico, which of course it wasn't. But it would have seemed like something from outer space. And if you imagine what 3D and advanced additive are becoming in the next five to 10 years, if it was dropped into us today, we'd probably have a hard time recognizing it. But preparing for it means following Raymond Lowy's principle of most advanced yet acceptable. And it worked pretty well for Raymond. He uh, didn't just streamline steam engines, but think about this. You know, he, he designed cars, he designed the logo for Air Force One, he helped NASA with the moon program. This is a gentleman who used that principle to go all the way from the age of steam to the age of rocket travel, which if you map that out, that's an exponential curve. That's the secret. Most advanced yet acceptable, leading but staying tuned to what's possible. And, and I'll close with just one last observation that goes back, and I've, oh darn, I think I've lost them. By the way, if you want one of these nifty little lights, uh, they don't, they made a lot of these, you know, and, uh, and I picked this one up on eBay about three weeks ago. It only cost a couple of bucks, and the best part about it is it still works. You know, it still works. I plugged it in the wall and it lit up. And I thought, boy, isn't that the message? The trick of success in this exponential moment in material sciences is it's not enough to just be first. Also be lasting. Think about things that last a long time. Think about things that are permanent. The way to succeed in this rapidly changing exponential environment is Pay attention to the permanent stuff as well. Thank you.